Happy Friday, everybody, and welcome to episode 66 of The Snyder Cut. I am your sleep-deprived host, Jeff Snyder, senior film reporter at Collider. And we have, I don't know, it's not going to be a jam-packed show, guys. There's not much going on. Was The news is still a little slow coming out of the, the break. Yeah, we had a couple stories here and there. It wasn't anything that exciting. I was off all week on vacation. That's why I missed uh, the taping on Thursday. Um, so I have not been paying attention to a lot of stuff. I am not all caught up. I barely know what day it is. I've probably gotten 10 or 12 hours of sleep the entire week. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> Buckle up. It's going to be a bumpy ride today. Let's start with the biggest property in the world. Star Wars. Dun, dun, dun. Michael Waldron, who served as the head writer on the Loki series and apparently the writer of Doctor Strange 2. I love all these writers just fucking come out of nowhere for these things. Um, like I thought Doctor Strange 2 had like two or three different writers who were not named Michael Waldron. Anyways, he has been tapped to write the uh, Star Wars movie that Kevin Feige is making. What is the Star Wars movie that Kevin Feige is making about? I have no idea. Nobody has any idea. Is it about old characters, new characters? I have no idea. Uh, here's what I know. I know that Loki looks good. I like the trailer that, that Marvel put out for that. Um, and yes, yeah, so I guess Michael Waldron has become some sort of a go-to scribe for, for Marvel and Kevin Feige. And, and, you know, now he's going to come over and work on Star Wars. I don't like, I guess if you can write these types of movies, then you, then you can write, like any of them, like, you know, like if you can write a Marvel, big, a big Marvel sequel, you can write a big Star Wars movie. But I don't know, like, are these different things in fandoms? Like, aren't there people who grew up reading comic books? And then there are people who grew up worshiping Star Wars. I'm sure there's a lot of overlap between those two groups, but I don't know. Like, are, are there really people who can do both? Like, the, I would want to hire like the biggest Star Wars geek or the biggest Marvel geek. And I just have a hard time believing that one guy, this Michael Waldron, can, can straddle both these universes. You know, I mean, but what do I know? I, I haven't seen any of his, his work, have I? Star Wars, guys. This is, this is what we're leading with. This is, how, this is how this show has fallen. You know me. I would never lead with Star Wars. I don't care about Star Wars, but this is what I'm relegated to in the first week of 2021. Uh, Paramount picked up Spamalot. This is a project that, like, just could not get made of Fox. What is Paramount doing? I know Paramount is Fox because Jim Giannopoulos and uh, Emma Watts and all these people, like, it's the same leadership that Fox had that basically drove Fox into the ground. Now they're doing it with Paramount, picking up leftovers like spam a lot spam a lot was like a big stage show what 10 years ago 15 years ago who cares about this stuff eric idol monty python that was never my bag you know you don't even know how many stars i've heard rumored for these roles between tiffany haddish and peter dinklage and it's just like who cares i don't care pass it is going to be that kind of show so if you're not digging the vibe just just stop watching right now. It's fine. I, I won't be upset. I, I'm cranky. I haven't slept. Th that you're, This is the Snyder Cut you're getting today. Jesse Buckley and Rory Kinnear in Alex Garland's new movie, Men. Great title. Alex Garland, can you just like, I don't know, come up with a normal fucking title? Ex Machina, Devs, Men. What are these, what are these titles? Not a fan. Rory Kinnear, uh, he's the guy from the Bond movies, right? I, I, I wasn't he in, was he in a Black Mirror? He's okay. Um, I, you know, he's I don't think he's the male lead in this though, is he? Or, or maybe he is because the movie is about Jesse Buckley going on some sort of vacation after the death of her ex husband. So I don't think he's playing the ex husband. Or maybe he is. I don't know. I know that Jesse Buckley is a great get for Alex Garland. I, I'm definitely looking forward to seeing them work together. I could see that actually uh, going really well, although I don't know. Alex Garland is sort of like a Charlie Kaufman and Buckley just did the Charlie Kaufman movie, which I hated. I couldn't stand it. Uh, so 
let's just hope this isn't another one of those. Again, can't really, if it is, I couldn't really fault Jesse Buckley for wanting to work with Alex Garland, but uh, you know, maybe like those kinds of strange sci-fi horror movies are, are just where her head is at. Um, either way, you know, a, a nice get for Alex Garland, uh, landing Jesse Buckley, who's in high demand. Uh, Norm, sorry, Noma Dumaswani. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but the actress from The Undoing, the one who played uh, Hugh Grant's attorney, who was great. She was, I thought she was uh, excellent. She has joined the cast of The Little Mermaid in a new role. Okay. Like, wh wh like what am I supposed to say about these items? Like, uh, wh what else had a new role? Didn't Aladdin, was, was Jenny Slate playing a new role? I didn't even see Aladdin. Um, are these Are these new roles vital? Or are they just a way of getting some diversity in the cast? It's like, I mean, this, this actress is, is a very, very talented uh, actress. Um, but uh, yeah, how does she fit into the world of The Little Mermaid? And, and why at this stage? I, just, I, I do not know. I do not know. Tiffany Haddish, Landscape with Invisible Hand. This is a, a project that, uh, this is the first like scoop of 2021, if you will, in, in a sense. Uh, the first big kind of deadline studio package. It's over at MGM and Plan B, Brad Pitt's company. Corey Finley is going to be directing this one. This is the guy who did Thoroughbreds and Bad Education. So talented director. What happened to like his, his weed uh, movie, the, the Rainbow, whatever the hell it was called. Um, he was doing something involving like, you know, weed farmers and the government coming after them. Uh, that is the project that I wanted to see. Landscape with Invisible Hand. Like, what are these titles? Landscape with Invisible Hand. Who's going to watch that? I mean, are, are studios even thinking like this anymore? Are they even thinking who's going to come see a movie like Landscape with Invisible Hand? Or do they just come up with these ridiculous titles because, oh, it's streaming. And so people are, will, will click on it as long as there's a movie star space in the box. <sighs> landscape with invisible hand. Who the fuck is seeing a movie starring Tiffany Haddish with that title? It's a sci-fi movie with Tiffany Haddish. Another thing, nobody wants to see Tiffany Haddish in a sci-fi movie. I'm convinced that MGM is, isn't making any of these movies. And MGM is just filling its development pipeline so that when Apple or, who, or Amazon, whoever buys MGM, they have, oh, well, now we're, we're in business with this star and this star and this star and all the stars in the world. But I don't think MGM is pulling the trigger on any of these fucking projects. I don't have any money. Took a 50, 60 million dollar hit just delaying no time to die. I'm telling you, half this stuff is just, there's just announcements and attachments and none of it is real. Uh, Malignant, James Wan's movie, got an R rating. I've heard this movie is terrible. I've heard that the test screenings were atrocious and that people were laughing at the movie. I, I mean, again, I'm the guy who thinks Saw is a masterpiece, but James Wan, like, what else have you done? Like a bunch of garbage, right? We're talking about Aquaman, James Wan, Dead Silence, Dead Death Sentence, like, Conjuring movie, like what? What is this? What? Anyway, okay, Malignant, rated R, great, good, good for you, Malignant. I heard you are garbage. Uh, just like I heard Wonder Woman eighty four was garbage, and that turned out to be correct as well. Uh, geez, remember? Oh God, I, did we talk about this last week? Patty Jenkins being announced as the director of Wonder Woman three, which felt like it was just an automated press release that was going to be sent no matter what. No matter if, if, if no one in the country and the world watched WW84, we were still going to get that press release saying Patty Jenkins is back for Wonder Woman 3. How does she direct Wonder Woman 3? The answer is she doesn't. She's doing Star Wars, right? Like, I, I just have 99% doubt that she's going to be directing Wonder Woman 3. Uh, this last movie was atrocious, okay? Like... I just don't get it. Do you, do you do that announcement? What is the point of that? 
to, to show that you have confidence in, in the second movie and we're, we're pressing forward on the third that no one seems to want or, or asking for. Like, I just, I don't think that this is realistic for her timeline, for her schedule. She'll end up producing and, and hiring, uh, you know, some sort of protege, likely a woman. But it's like, you know, even on the way, you know, the last week, Patty's like, oh, there was an internal war on every level, you know, on that first Wonder Woman w- movie and, and dealing with her early date, like, you just see her sort of burning the bridge a little bit, like starting to talk more and more shit, trying to explain, fall over herself to explain why this movie was so bad. And it's just, you know, Warner Brothers executives are just a disaster lately. Don't like it. Nope. Don't care who directs Wonder Woman 3 because it's going to be garbage no matter what. Uh, visionary director Sam Levinson. Ooh, got a trailer from Malcolm and Marie today from visionary director Sam Levinson. What a visionary. Please stop doing this, guys. Please, until you're an actual visionary, please stop calling yourselves visionary director. Can there be some kind of board where it's me and Frosty and fucking Jermaine and Peter Sharetta? and the fucking film Twitter bloggers unite. And we actually come up with who gets a visionary, who, who gets to call themselves visionary. Cause it's wild. It's crazy. Who's becoming a, a, a visionary director over the last year or two, right under my nose. I didn't even notice. You direct a few fucking euphoria episodes and you're a visionary director. Wow. Um, geez, that is something. I watched that uh, Euphoria Christmas special, by the way. Boring. I get that you have to keep your fan base engaged, but like that's not Euphoria. I get that it's COVID and you can only work with a limited number of actors in each scene. And uh, but like, okay, so we couldn't do Euphoria season two, but we didn't want to leave you hanging, so we did this these two Christmas specials. And this one has three actors in him, including a new guy, Coleman Domingo. And it's just him talking, you know, doing a fucking sponsor meeting with Zendaya. With Zendaya. Like, that's not euphoric. That is, maybe it helps you understand her character a little bit better. Maybe it fucking confuses you even more uh, about her character. Who, You know, I don't, I don't think Rue is the most important or the most interesting character on Euphoria, like, at all. I think mean, she's, like, kind of boring. Um yeah, just not a fan of, of that label, not a fan of, of the Euphoria uh, holiday special. The trailer for Malcolm Marie. Um, so I know someone who, who has seen this movie. Uh, I heard it's not very good. Um, to me, it felt very overwritten. And Nomadland notwithstanding, I would say to be wary of any movie that has that that was produced by its stars if they are not regular producers. John David Washington, like this guy's not a producer, and now he's he's got a producing credit on this. Why? Because because he he you know agreed to star in it. Like I just you won't see a PGA credit next to that guy's name. I'm pretty sure. Um, his acting looks off in the trailer uh, it's like it just seems like he's playing it on a on a different level than her um i've heard this is a performance thing like that the movie is not very good uh but you know that uh zendaya's performance could get some attention that kind of thing i don't know i just don't see it i, I don't see things really breaking into the conversation this late in in the race i, I think the table has kind of been set um this comes out february 5th I hear it's just a lot of like Sam Levinson taking on his critics, basically, you know, lots of uh, references to IndieWire. And and, and uh, I just, this stuff is just such a, it's just a wank. Like, uh, I don't care. Uh, good, good for you, Sam Levinson. Good, good luck. Um, Clancy Brown. This was a good story. This was something that I was actually excited about this week. Clancy Brown got cast as the villain in the Dexter revival, which if you watched the show last week is my number one most anticipated piece of television next year. Uh, you know, I think it's, it doesn't say he's playing like a cop or a sheriff or something, or maybe just like a good guy, like a, a guy who like everybody in town knows, and like he takes care of his people and uh, you know, 
a, a widely admired pillar of the community. It's always those people who have skeletons in their closet and something to hide. And, and, and that sounds like the case with this Clancy Brown character. He's a, a great character actor, always super interesting. Um, and, and it just fits the mold for this show. When you look at guys like Jimmy Smith or John Lithgow, like they don't have the biggest stars, but they have like really solid actors uh, and Clancy Brown's a big boy. He's kind of intimidating, too. Um, I think that that could be interesting. I like that casting. You don't really see him get a lot of attention, Clancy Brown. Um, but I'm, I'm looking forward to that. That's exciting. Roku got all the Quibi content. Ooh, better get your Roku on now. Uh, Quibi actually had some good stuff. I'm not here to shit on Quibi uh, like everybody else. Is a terrible business model, but content-wise, I thought they had some interesting stuff, like you know, free free ration. If that was a movie, that probably would have been like a two and a half star movie, and, and some knucklehead probably would have been talking about it for uh, awards attention at, at this point. Um, I, you know, I thought that the get, well, not the guest, was it the no, the stranger, and uh, you know, the the fucking most dangerous game and the fugitive, like they had some decent stuff on that platform that nobody was watching. So if I can watch that now on Roku, um, which I don't even know if I have, it's like a free app, isn't it? Can't you just watch it for free? Do you need a Roku? To, like, do you need the hardware for it? I don't understand. I'm old. I'm old and cranky and tired. And uh, yeah, I don't understand all this stuff. Roku and Tubi and Pluto and fucking like Fubo and remember when like that great moment when we all just cut the cord and we rebelled and we got rid of the 500 channels and now we're going to be stuck with 500 streaming services. Like it's just, it's too much. And if someone like me doesn't get it, the average person is going just going to be fucking completely lost. Uh, Jeez, we basically like went through the news just then, uh, but I left the, the, the top story out. The top story, once again, for the umpteenth time, is Ray Fisher. What is this guy's deal? He has like some kind of a screw loose. Does he think he's going to go down in the record books? Like... MLK, Malcolm X, Ray Fisher? Like, dude, you're a fucking actor in a comic book movie, bro. Okay, so somebody brought you the coffee some one time and it was cold or like uh, they forgot the sugar or the milk. Like, what are you bitching about? Tell me, communicate, use your words, stop going on Twitter, do an actual like interview where you actually reveal the problems. Because he just, again, he takes, he just takes a grenade, pulls the pin, throws it and runs away like a coward. Ray Fisher, what is going on? How does this guy even have representatives? If I was Warner Brothers or Warner Media, I would just blacklist that agent's entire list until they just got rid of Ray Fisher. This dude is a fucking PR nightmare. He's a, he's a headache of ridiculous proportions who's just not worth it. Like, let me tell you, and, and like, I love this story that the rap, you know, wrote. Um, I mean, you know, I don't know what Umberto got right or wrong or what the timeline is. The, the, it's September 2014. Sorry, it's September 2014. September 14th, 2020. I wrote to Warner Brothers. I'm in asking around about The Flash. I've been told that Ray Fisher's character Cyborg has been written out of the film and will not appear, nor will the character be recast for that film. Please let me know if you can confirm on background. Warner Brothers said, just rumors, just, just rumors. It's like anyone with fucking eyes and ears in their head, anyone with a goddamn brain could have known that this guy was not going to be in The Flash movie. Like, there's news and then there's common sense. He's picking a, a war of words with the studio, studio's top leadership. He's not a celebrity. He's not, a, like, a name at all. He's not he's just, like, he's just, like, of course they're going to get rid of him. And, and in fact, they're not even going to just, like, get rid of him and bring somebody else in so they can, like, they're just going to forget about Cyborg. Cyborg is going to disappear. The character is just, like, 
dead. He's fucking gone because Ray Fisher is synonymous with Cyborg now, and they don't want Ray Fisher, and Cyborg will just poof disappear. What's the point of recasting him? Obviously, he, Ray Fisher wasn't going to be in the Flash movie. I I knew that in September. Did anybody say he was going to be in it? Wasn't he going to be in it like two, three, four years ago when they were developing it as like a buddy picture? I just don't understand how how things are news when they become news. You know, and Ray Fisher with the Walter Hamada stuff and Jeff Johns. Jeff Johns isn't going anywhere. He's a fucking executive producer on seven like Warner Media shows. Like uh, Walter Hamada just got extended this week. I love that. And you guys know this is all this is all PR. This is all Warner Brothers just being like, oh, you, you want to say you know bad shit about Walter Hamada? Well, fuck you, Ray Fisher. We're extending him. Now maybe Walter Hamada, maybe these movies that he comes up with sucks. Right, like I don't know when he came into the process on on Wonder Woman eighty four, that doesn't look good on, on on his track record. If if that was him, like these contracts and extensions, they mean nothing. They mean like they're, they're as valuable as release dates these days. If Warner Brothers wants to get rid of Walter Hamada, they will get rid of Walter Hamada. Really easy, but like. If if Ray Fisher is trying to get rid of them, get rid of him for them, obviously they're going to come out with that extension piece. Like this is just Hollywood PR, like one hundred and one. Oh man! By the way, I'm not even going to, to to get into specifics, but there are executives at Warner Brothers. I shall say uh, in communications, if you will. Uh, who are just way in over their heads. Just not not a good hire at the top there. Uh, yeah. Hire a fucking vicious pit bull like me. I'll come in and be your fucking CorpCon person, and I'll make sure Ray Fisher never opens his fucking mouth again. Like, I just, it's just too, too reactive. Um, hmm. Yeah, not, not a fan of, of anything coming out of Warner Brothers on the Corpcom side for like the last few months. And I think it's been a, a shit show of epic proportions uh, as far as the messaging goes. Um, man. Uh, I watched a great trailer this week. And it was a movie that we didn't cover on Collider. Uh, I wasn't surprised that that was the decision made. Um but you know what? I've been tracking it for years. I've been tracking it since before anybody knew what it was, since anybody since it premiered at Venice to largely negative reviews, since it got bought by a right-wing conservative website. And that trailer is Run, Hide, Fight. This is basically Die Hard in a school. It is a school shooting movie. Uh, and if you watch the trailer, which I thought was fantastic, it, it basically sh- you know shows the the protagonist, the this teenage girl, who you know is is a trained hunter, and you know she she's thank you. <sighs> she is a trained hunter. Thomas Jane is her dad, and, and he's like, I recognize that look in your eye. Like, men in my unit had that. Like, the 16-year-old girl has, like, lost it. She has a screw loose. Guys come in. They, they shoot up the school. She runs. She hides. And then she's out of the school, and she's like, I can't just leave my friends there. And she turns around and fights. Um, I don't know. Like, that just sounds like a fun genre B movie to me. Um, I don't know how where it – got this whole, I don't know, Republican, conservative, proud boy vibe to it, or if that just comes with the territory because it's produced by, by Dallas Sanye, who, like, I've known Dallas for a decade, maybe longer. Like, he wasn't always like that. Like, I think he just saw a void in the marketplace and decided to fill it. And frankly, you know, it's not a bad idea. Like, I'm not, I, I am a Democrat. I voted for Biden. I hate Donald Trump, but like part of me wonders, would it be a better career move for me to go be the Breitbart film critic? You know, like, 
I, I, rather than being the, the hundredth or two hundredth liberal voice, could I go be the top conservative critic? Like, I wouldn't change my opinions at all. It just changes the audience that I'm, I'm writing them for. But, you know, certainly I have these unpopular opinions and it's not about politics. Like I'm, fir I'm firmly, you know, a liberal on, on that front, but in terms of art, you know, there are people who would dismiss or look down upon a movie like Run, Hide, Fight. And I'm like, fucking sign me up. I can't wait to see it. So uh, but anyways, what's interesting about this is so the Daily Caller, I've never been to the website. I've, I think I've heard of it, um, bought the movie. And it's like, I wonder if you're going to see more websites do that. Like if this movie speaks to the audience that our website is for, and this movie is having trouble getting distribution, what if we just bought it and put it on our website and charged people who want to see it? Because those people are already here. Now, I don't know if Run, Hide, Fight, if, it's, if it is available for sale, if they're just making it available for free on their YouTube channel and, and like getting YouTube ad money. Like, I don't know what the actual business model of it is, but it sounded like the Daily Caller was going to be making more acquisitions, which means that you need Hollywood. It has to be willing to sell to them, you know, and, and Dallas is, uh, you know, he's an independent producer. He, he's not necessarily Hollywood, um, but I wonder if more independent producers will turn out this kind of content for this kind of audience with the expectation that a place like the Daily Caller will, will give it a, a platform. Um, I mean, it really is no different than like Collider buying the last blockbuster, you know, like if the producers of the last blockbuster, you know, I don't know if they got proper distribution or they just put it on iTunes themselves, but it, you know, what if Collider got an early look at the movie and they were like, wow, we think we could actually make money making this movie, you know, available behind a paywall on our site or something like, I don't know. It's, it's, it is interesting food for thought. So even though I don't condone the daily caller or their political beliefs or any of that shit, if I have to go to the website to watch a movie that I want to watch, I'm going to do it. I'm planning to watch American skin this weekend with Nate Parker. Like, you know, I, I just, I, I, if I want to see a movie, I want to see a movie. I don't care who made it. I don't care what they did. That's me. You know, this is America. That's my choice. You can make your choice. Um, but that, you know, the Daily Caller thing, it's, it sort of plays into the, um, one of the mailbag questions that we had from last week that we skipped. Will Dr uh, Drowdulis said, hey, Jeff, I was just wondering what you think will be some of the biggest movie stories of 2021 worth following. Uh, and so one of them was, you know, will there be these weird distributors popping up like the Daily Caller? Uh I don't know that that is interesting to consider. Will, uh, you know, some other ones that I thought like will Warner media stick to its day and date plan. Again, you saw how horribly it was handled. And I, and I actually can't blame Jason Kylar for that decision. Like it, people are operating out of like ignorance or naivete with this, uh, pandemic, like the pandemic's not going anywhere and people aren't just running back to theaters the second they get a vaccine. Like you have to adjust. And, and I think that this was a smart move on Warner Media, Media's play, whether, even though they may have botched how it was communicated to the town. The question is, will they stick to that plan? Just because they announce something doesn't mean they have to stick to it. Just because a, a studio announces where we're going to be releasing this movie on day X doesn't mean that movie has to come out on day X. So don't be surprised if some of these movies that you think are going to be debuting on HBO Max actually don't. And they're just held until 2022. Like, I just don't see, like, what the fuck? We're going to release The Matrix 4 on fucking HBO Max? What? Hold that movie. No one even, people don't even know that they're making a Matrix 4. Like, what is the rush? We've waited this long for part four. It's not like there's like, it's not like Wonder Woman 2 where the clock is already ticking. And if you, if you put it on a shelf for another year, it like loses some relevance. Like, The Matrix is fucking old. Don't put that movie there. Don't put Dune there either. I mean, that's just too expensive. Like you need to, if you want to make your money back, you need to put that movie in theaters. You're not, it is not going to generate enough subscriptions to merit the cost, to justify the cost. It's crazy. 
so don't be surprised if Warner Media does an about face uh, on that front, particularly if Chris Nolan threatens to leave. I mean, shit. What, what do you do then? Other stories. Will MGM be sold? And what about Sony? You know, like, how long can these studios survive? MGM is just waiting for Bond. As soon as Bond comes out or doesn't come out, there will be movement afoot on MGM. Um, yeah, Sony. Like, what is Sony doing? Well, they've got Ghostbusters and Spider-Man 3 and Venom 2. And then, like, is that is this just, like, the Spider-Man studio from now on? Like, Japan doesn't even want to be in this business. Get, get out of the business. Sell yourself to, to a streamer. Give them the library. Like, I, what is happening at Sony? I, it just... It's sad. It's sad to see what the pandemic has done to this business and, and the landscape. Not that Sony was doing great before, you know, before it all. Uh, the battle of the blockbusters. You know, now that we have all these movies that are being held for theaters, like they're just coming out one on top of each other and they're jockeying for position. And, and these movies, are, some of them are just going to tank. They're going to bomb. That's why Universal, even though, you know, they started out being the villain in this story, they're the hero now. I mean, the fact that they can release movies in theaters, nobody's going to see them, you know, maybe a few million dollars worth of people. And then it's on VOD 17 days later, rather than having to wait 90 days, like these other studios who have to wait for the three, you know, the three month pay period and shit. Like, just fucking get it up on VOD. Uh, but yeah, that, that's what's going to happen to these blockbusters. Like they're, they're going to underperform at the box office and, and it's just fucking the, the, the millions, if not billions of dollars being wasted off. But I understand you can't just, you can't just hold everything. You know, these, these, these you can't have them on the books for too long and, and you need some cash flow. Uh, another story, will Oscar changes become permanent? You know, like, how do you say, the, yeah, it's a pandemic, we're changing the rules a little bit, but like, I don't know, how, how do you just do, how do you, how do you just go back on everything once the toothpaste is out of the tube? And the whole like thing about intentions and like, was this intended to go to theaters or are they just saying it was intended to go to theaters knowing the whole time it was always going to be a streaming movie, you know? This year, I think, is is, is weird, um, different maybe even next year. But, like, I wouldn't be surprised if these Oscar changes actually stuck. So I think that is something to watch. I, I, all these Oscar decisions were made way, 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 way too quickly and way, way, way too early. Um, yeah, I just, I'm, I'm very pessimistic today, as, as, as you can tell, about... Yeah, I mean, that, that's the question. What are some of the biggest movie stories of 2021, man? I just hope that there are movie stories because this whole fucking industry could, it could implode. Like, it's, I don't even, like, with filming stuff, like, I can't go back to California. California is a nightmare. And, and people are still, uh, you know, worried about the economy and, and getting productions back up and running. Like, of course you have to pause production on everything. They rush back way too quickly. That's why everybody's still sick there. That's why the, town, the whole city is in disarray. Forget the industry. The industry is obviously a big part of Los Angeles, but Los Angeles is also a lot bigger than just Hollywood. And the whole city is like chaos. I think you got to fix Los Angeles before you can fix Hollywood. And, 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 I, I just very down on everything, man. Because <laughs> I look at the knuckleheads in charge and uh, I, I just don't have any faith. I don't have any faith in, in the politicians. I don't have any faith in the studio leadership. I mean, you know, with, with, with some exceptions, you know, but uh, I, I, just, I think we're fucked. I think we're totally fucked. Um, I've got a couple other trailers this week, a lockdown trailer. This looks like uh, they shot this in like September and October. I, I, is that like the thing of, like that with these streaming services, you don't need a ton of marketing lead up. You can just boom, put it out there and, and see if it sinks or swims. This movie's coming out next week, shot three months ago. Is this just to qualify for Golden Globes? Because it could be a comedy or musical play. Like, 
Was that intended for yet for theatrical release? <sighs> Knowing full well was made at a time when theatrical releases weren't even like feasible. Um, the best trailer I saw this week was probably the investigation, this HBO series about the murder of Kim Wall. Now, last year at Sundance, there was a fascinating documentary called Into the Deep that was about that very case. Uh, and Peter Madsen, uh, the submarine creator who, who, uh, who, who killed her. Um, and that movie, I don't know where it is. I think Netflix got it. We haven't seen or heard anything about it. I guess it was a pretty good year for documentaries if you look at my top 10 list. So maybe it wasn't the dumbest decision to hold it until next year. But at the same time, it's like, okay, where is it? You know, like, release a trailer, do, release something. Uh, I wonder if there was some kind of legal issue with it. Um, like, if, we, if it's never going to see the light of day. But I'd, I'd be just kind of surprised if the HBO series beat this thing out. And I know it's a foreign series, which, which really limits its audience. You know, not a lot of people are probably going to be watching the investigation, but God, what a story. And, and Tobias Lindholm directed, he's a fantastic director. Uh, but yeah, I want to see Into the Deep. I want to show that movie to people because it is going to be a talker. Let me tell you, it's wild. Uh, da, 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 da. That's it. That's basically it. I wanted to, I guess, close the show with just my my Oscar picks. Um, let me just see if anything else broke. No. Okay. Um, all right. Oscars. Let's 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 talk turkey. We got. I'm, I'm going to end the show very early. It's not going to be an hour. Uh, if I was voting for best picture, and this movie has definitely come on in the awards race. I think you can see just the momentum and heat that it is gaining. Sound of Metal. Obviously, it was my number one. But, like, as an actual Best Picture winner, I think it's worthy. I think, you know, we have to stop thinking of diversity as being about black or white or Asian or Latino. Like, it's just, it's about more than that. And uh, I think that the the deaf community, um, not just the deaf community, but other, you know, people with disabilities, like th these people are just overlooked. Um, and Sound of Metal is, is, is incredible. It's, it's an incredible human story about self-acceptance and, uh, and, and perseverance and addiction and love. And I think there's, and, and compassion. I think there's a lot going on in this movie that, and it really has a great message at its center. Um, Honestly, maybe even better than the message that something like Nomadland has, which I see as its as its main competition and the likely front runner. But uh, I don't think Sound of Metal really stands a chance in the race. But I think that's too bad um, because it, it it's a very worthy winner in my book, and and that would absolutely get my vote for director. Um, as great a job as I thought Darius Martyr did do with it, I, I would probably split and I probably would go uh, with Chloe Zhao for Nomadland. Um, yeah, I just thought it was, uh, you know, beautifully shot and, and uh, edited and, um, you know, the, the performance that, that she gets out of these people who aren't, you know, natural performers or actors and just the authenticity and the music, and just everything. It was uh, Chloe Zhao... Also, maybe maybe it's the fact that it's her second film too. Like, I, I wouldn't necessarily want to give best director to a first time director. Um, so, like, I, I'm, I can't wait to see what Darius Martyr does next. But you know, with, after songs my brother taught me and and uh, and the rider and everything, I think I think Chloe Zhao would be very deserving. Uh, and yeah, I want to see another woman win best director too. That would be cool. Best actor is uh, Riz Ahmed and best supporting actor would be Paul Racy from The Sound of Metal. I just don't see how anyone gave better performances than these two guys this year. Uh, as great as Chadwick Boseman was in Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, and I did think that he was excellent. I thought some of the guys in, in One Night in Miami were excellent. Um, but uh, Riz and Paul Racy deserve this. I, I mean... It, and it sucks, like, you know, if you're Delroy Lindo and you have decades of, of you know, really impressive work and then you're just knocking out of the park and into five bloods. As, as great as he is, I, I can't, I can't 
compare that performance and the anger in that performance with what Riz and Paul Racy accomplished in, in Sound of Metal. I just can't. Um, best Actress would be Frances McDormand. So, so far, all the awards have gone to Nomadland and Sound of Metal. Listen, it wasn't wasn't the, the world's greatest year in narrative uh, filmmaking, I don't think. Um, but yeah, Frances McDormand, give her a third Oscar. She was tremendous. And then Supporting Actress... Uh, it wasn't a, a ton to choose from here, but I went with uh, Yu Jung Yoon uh, from Minari. I just loved her as the grandmother, just like I loved um, Zhao Zhuzhen, Zhao Zhuzhen from The Farewell. Maybe it's just you know something about me and uh, you know um, Asian grandmothers or something. But uh, yeah, I, I thought she was wonderful. Um, so yeah, that's who I would vote for, for, for the big six awards. And yeah, I can't believe we have to talk about these movies for another four fucking months. Like why, why couldn't the Academy have just stuck to its normal timetable? I don't understand what these next two months are supposed to be accommodating, you know, besides maybe Judas and the black Messiah, you know, the U S versus Billy holiday, but like, there's just no reason that those movies couldn't have come out in December. Like, did they think that we'd be back in theaters by now, the Academy? I just, oh, it just doesn't make any sense to me. And that, that's why I'm upset because nothing seems to make sense anymore. You look at what happened this week at the, in the, in the, at the U.S. Capitol, like nothing makes sense. The world doesn't make sense. America doesn't make sense. Hollywood doesn't make sense to me anymore. It has changed so much since I arrived in town 14, 15 years ago. Oh, fuck, man. That's it. That's all I got. I'm, I'm wiped. It's been a long week. That's the podcast. Thank you for watching the Snyder Cut. I am on Twitter, Instagram, Cameo, at the Insider. You know where to find me. Hopefully next week, Justin Kroll, Boris Kidd will break some stories and we'll actually have some fun, exciting news to talk about. But this was just sort of going through the leftovers, the, the bits and scraps and... Uh, yeah, Ray Fisher. Just stop, buddy. Just stop. I'm telling you, no producers and executives want to work with you and be doing TV the rest of your life. Quit while you're ahead. If you're still ahead at this point. Uh, yeah, goodbye. That's it. I'm done. Curtains. <laughs> <laughs>